Hi, everyone. We can't wait for today's conversation because we are discussing the connection between spelling and reading. And we're here today with Pam Kastner. Pam is an educational consultant at Patton and serves as the state lead for literacy in my home state of Pennsylvania. She's also a professor at Mount St. Joseph University in the Reading Science Program, and we are so excited you're here with us today. Welcome, Pam. Such an honor to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me, Melissa and Lori. Yeah. Lori's been talking about your session at Plain Talk since we got back, so... I have to Work. tell you, I, I put a, all the notes on a notepad in my phone, and I I can't delete it. It's just, I just keep adding to it. So thank you for that. I, 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 I know we met at Plain Talk, you know, in January, back in January. And my biggest takeaway from that really amazing presentation you did is that when we are teaching spelling, we are teaching reading. So I thought it might be helpful for us to kick off today's conversation with you sharing how spelling connects to reading. Well, they are reciprocal um, processes. There's no doubt about that. But um, one way I start out my presentation, which you took part in, um, is I have a series of words, about four of them, that I put up on a screen. And I say, okay, we're going to read these words, and it's going to be choral, and I'm going to see um, how fluent you are at reading these words. And in every single case, um, all four of those words, um, they read them accurately and automatically. They are in their sight word vocabulary. And then I say, okay, let's take out a pencil and paper or take out your phone and write in uh, a text to yourself. We're going to spell those words. <laughs> so um, in every single case, and I've done this many times, um, I've only once ever gotten a four out of four where the words were in the, um, uh, the participants' um, sight word vocabulary, but also they were able to spell them, which meant they had complete and accurate recall and memory for that word. So it, it really shows that we're making that statement about um, spelling and reading or reciprocal process. Um, spelling is a much higher linguistic skill. And if you can spell a word, you can read a word, but it kind of shows them right from the beginning. If you can read a word, it doesn't mean you can spell it. So you're benefiting reading when you're teaching spelling. It's like one of those rare cases um, when you can be so efficient with your instruction and you're getting like double bang for your buck. And that doesn't happen very often. But unfortunately, in the world of linguistics, uh, our language systems, I think that spelling is not, it's like maybe the stepchild <laughs> of all the language systems. It, it doesn't get the attention that it should. So just like in the um, presentation, I've been telling everybody, no matter whether I'm training on spelling or anything else, my name is Pam Spelling Kastner, <laughs> just to bring attention to how, how important it is and what benefits it can um, realize for teachers and for kids. So do you want to do that? Do you want me to have the audience do that? I was just that? going to ask you <laughs> if you wanted to give some examples. Yeah. Okay. So um, pretend that I've just placed the word, and you've read it accurately and automatically. And now I'm going to ask you to just take out a pencil and paper and spell it. I'm writing it down, but I think I'm cheating. <laughs> okay. The next word I put up is fuchsia, which is a beautiful color. And always when I'm um, doing this, I say the word, you say the word, and I use it in a sentence, right? So fuchsia is a beautiful color. And my sentence for accommodate is I have six grandchildren. <laughs> when they come to my house, I always accommodate my six grandchildren. Next word is narcissistic. And you'd say that back. Um, to be narcissistic is not um, an enviable um, trait. What's my word? Narcissistic. narcissistic. Good job. Um, last word, onomatopoeia. What oh. word? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tricky one. <laughs> but in every case, everyone reads it accurately. Um, onomatopoeia is a literary device. What word? Onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia. <laughs> I was so, focused on trying to spell it. <laughs> back uh, in your own homes or wherever you are, hopefully if you're driving, you, you didn't do this, you pulled over. Uh, but what you'll likely find is that you are able to read these words, but if you um, cover them and then attempt to spell them, you likely will have some, um, some errors because you do not yet, and I always like to say yet, um, have a complete and accurate memory for that word um, stored. So... It just shows us how important um, spelling is in calling attention to the internal structure of words. Oftentimes when kids are reading, we see them 
look at the beginning part, so maybe the end, and um, sometimes even throw in a synonym there. And so when we're spelling, we must pay attention to the entire sequence, the letter sequence, its pronunciation, and then bond it to meaning to map it. So it's, it's just an incredible way to both benefit spelling, but also reading. I'm curious with those words, just if, if I can read them, but I can't spell them. I, I feel like some people might ask like, well, so what? If I can't spell that word, why does it matter <laughs> if I can read it just fine? Well, because um, people judge your intelligence for sure based on your spelling ability. Um, we certainly know that even from some research around job applications when there are spelling errors, even if you know, it doesn't, it doesn't infer your intelligence, but people will make a, a judgment around spelling. So people who are good readers, but poor spellers, they don't have fully specified memories for those words. So they're able to kind of sample in because when you're reading the words like right in front of you, everything is there that you need to decode it if you have the knowledge, right? So you map the sequence of letters to its pronunciation. If you're reading it in text, right, after you've decoded it, you can kind of check yourself um, with meaning. So you have a lot of information supplied for you when you're reading, but when you're spelling, you know, you're pretty much starting from scratch. You're, you're I always think about it this way, because um, I taught kindergarten many years, you know, kids begin with speech, right? Um, what comes out their mouth comes out their pencil, right? And then they map those letter sequences to, to the phonemes. They're mapping a phoneme to a grapheme. So they begin with speech and move to print. And it's a much more difficult skill. You're holding those um, sounds in memory. Um, you have to remember what the grapheme form looks like for that particular spelling uh, of that phoneme. And also, you know, although not talked about very much, um, you have to write it. There's graphomotor things going on as well, right? So it's a, it's a highly complex skill, um, writing is, and spelling is as well. Uh, it's a linguistic skill, but sometimes um, there's confusion. They think it's a visual memory process. So in particular words that um, are high frequency words, and I uh, listened to you, uh, Katie and Danielle again, I'm big fans of both of their research. Um, we've had this misunderstanding of uh, spelling that is a visual memory process when it's a linguistic process. And the benefits by um, focusing on those lingu linguistic processes through spelling is that it benefits not only the spelling, but also the reading. That was a mouthful. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, I feel like that really resonates. And the thing that I compare it to in my brain is the idea that the highest you know, level for like how reading and writing are reciprocal. And the highest level for exporting and knowing what you're reading about is writing. And in between there is that oral discourse or some sort of oral um, support, rehearsal. Sup yes, oral mm -hmm. rehearsal. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, then that really does kind of bridge it and bring it around to a full circle. And so that's kind of making a lot of sense here with what you're saying about spelling and reading as well. Oh, good. In yeah. the handwriting. <laughs> and handwriting, handwriting, yes. handwriting in there too, yes. so there you go. Oh my gosh, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to switch gears a little bit now to talk about instruction because that's what our, our listeners want to hear about is how do we teach spelling? So I just want to, thinking back to how I learned how to spell was not <laughs> good, no. was, you know, those spelling lists we got on Monday and then I, they seemed like kind of random, you know, 10 random words. I don't know where they came from. And then homework throughout the week. We wrote them five times each, sentences, whatever we did during the week. And then we had a test on Friday. And then I don't think we really saw those words anymore. That was kind of it, right? We saw the, we got the test and we were done. That's how it happened for me. It was <sighs> like uh, words on Monday, practice them at home for the most part. Right. And then Friday, take the test and Saturday, forget them. Right? Exactly. Right. Which so. is clearly not the best way. So let's talk about better yeah. ways to do it. Um, let's, I just wanted to start with that first question of just which words to choose. And so can you talk a little bit about how teachers would choose words and probably even bigger than that of, you know, what would a whole effective scope and sequence for teaching Hopefully spelling look like? from the beginning, um, th there would be, a, again, that reciprocal relationship between phonics from decoding and encoding the phonics patterns that we're teaching would then follow through with words with those phonics patterns that they would be asked were as um, humans were pattern seekers right so we would want to teach uh, them in patterns 
Um, it would go, um, ex we would teach it explicitly, um, not implicitly. Um, we would teach the language system. So by explicitly, I mean directly. Uh, it would be systematic. It would be taught from least complex to most complex. Um, we would be teaching, um, when we taught these patterns, the principles of spelling. So for example, like position, those orthotactic um, constraints. So, um, there is no, as you, you guys know and your listeners know, there's no one universal um, bonic scope and sequence, right? right. Um, however, when you look at those that align with the evidence, they follow those structures, least complex to most complex. And most frequent way we would spell this um, phoneme with graphemes um, to least. So we're very systematic in our instruction. We're very explicit with it. And we're marrying um, decoding and encoding. What I'm reading, I should be spelling. What I'm spelling, I should be reading, especially in the early early grades to help kids understand this principle, that alphabetic principle that we represent um, speech sounds with graphemes. And when we're spelling, we're representing you know, the opposite way around. So um, like the Hannah, Hannah, Hodges, and Rudolph, that long ago uh, seminal research that, you know, talks about spelling patterns, that would influence our spelling. I think it's important to have that background knowledge so that um, teachers can be like critical consumers of the materials that they have and um, make adjustments um, where necessary based on that knowledge. But it would be very systematic and it would, um, as Denise Eyed, I don't know if you had her on, you did. Yeah, I think I did, haven't yeah. had a chance to listen to that yet. I have she's to. She's great. Um, I think that's why she's called it the logic of English, right? Yeah. We are trying to make it very clear there is a logic to our language and um, not, in, you know, send the message that it's, um, you know, disarrayed and we can't really figure out. It's, you know, we often hear the term like English is crazy. It really isn't. Um, when we know um, our own language, we can look at any word and we can tell you, oh, that's why it's spelled that way. You know, we are, we have a really robust, rich language. And um, we borrowed from many other languages. And oftentimes when we look at a spelling, um, that is one way we can say, oh, the reason it's spelled this way or pronounced that way is because, you know, the CH, maybe Denise talked about that, many people do, but Anglo Saxon is going to be pronounced. And if it is a Greek origin, it's going to be k. And if it's um, French, you're going to hear sh. So the kids, the spelling is stable, but the pronunciation is influenced by its um, word origin. And I find that kids love that. They love being word detectives and, oh, this is why it's spelled that way. Um, and then it makes sense. It's logical. So I, I think that um, for myself, I will say um, years ago, these were things that were not taught to me. So you can't teach what you don't know. So, um, you know, we need to know our own language so that we can teach it. Yeah, for sure. I'm thinking if I were a listener right now, I'd be so jazzed by what you said and thinking, what routines can I use to teach this in my classroom? And I'll share, Pam, you know, when I, when I was, a, I think, very early career teacher, I used some routines that probably weren't the best, you know, rainbow words and, you know, write the words five times. And I mean, even I'm, I'm sure they just went down and like wrote the first letter, wrote the second letter, wrote the third, you know, not very productive, also not just generally not helpful. So I know you have some tools in your toolbox to share about instructional routines we can use in our classrooms to help yeah. students, you know, engage yeah. in spelling routines. Yeah, I shared some of those at um, the presentation at Plain Talk, but I think they're probably likely familiar to a lot of your uh, listeners, but phoning, graphing, mapping, um, Catherine Grace's work, certainly for me, um, phoning, graphing, mapping is the bridge between um, phonology and orthography, right? That's exactly what it is. Um, it's making clear um, the sequence of phonemes uh, and then mapping those to the graphemes that represent them. Um, in phoning, graphing, mapping, we're kind of putting them into boxes, right? Um, or, you know, teachers can do that with a line uh, for representing each sound that they hear and then um, showing the, representing the graphemes that um, represent those phonemes. But I think it's important to remember that prior to that, there was explicit instruction <laughs> in those phonemes and graphemes because we can't map, we can't map what we have not been taught. So, um so if, especially for like um, high frequency words, which I know you've had um, others on talking about, certainly we want to map to all the sounds. There's no special place in the brain 
for a word like said and a word like cat. Um, we orthographically map um, a word exactly the same. We look at the sequence of letters, the orthography, we map it to um, the phonemes. Um, maybe some of those graphemes are unexpected, um, but it doesn't matter. They map the same way. And if anything, um, Dave Kilpatrick on his book, Assessing, Preventing, and Overcoming Reading Difficulties, I don't know why this always sticks in my head, but on page 109 says, you know, those words need more attention, more analysis, not less. And we've been teaching the spelling of those in ways that focus on their visual form or their visual sequence rather than the, their linguistic features. So um, a simultaneous oral spelling, if you're Orton Gillingham trained, you're probably very familiar with that. You know, I say the word, you say, just like we were doing earlier, I say the word, you say the word, I want the phonological word form in your mouth correctly, so you have a memory for that. And um, then uh, we tap out sounds, right? Um, I have you maybe write those lines or those boxes, how many sounds, show me, first sounds, uh, for example, I said, and, and then you just go and sequence. And I'm always using it in a sentence too. In order to bond a word in memory, you must bond phonology, orthography, and meaning and my only concern with spelling and some routines that I'm seeing is there is no meaning. And um, we are assumiciding, as my friend Anita would say, we're assumiciding that the student has that meaning in their word, in their um, semantic lexicon, and um, they may not. So they're not going to form that fully specified memory for that word. They're not going to orthographically map it. So I think it's always important to think about how we're integrating it's like back to the simple view. We're never uh, living only in the land of word recognition or only in the land of meaning. We're always integrating language um, and not isolating that. And so within um, a sequence of a lesson, you would find th uh, this kind of routine, but it's not isolated. There's been a phonological um, probably warm up prior to that. There's been a reminder of um, letter sound correspondences if it was kindergarten. Um, there's a, a reminder of the sequence. We write from left to right. All of these language, if um, we're selling it in a sentence, we might say that's an adjective. Remember that um, describes, an adjective describes. We're talking about it's part of speech, it's meaning, right? So I'm always thinking about the integration of phonology, orthography. Uh, morphology, semantics, syntax, uh, even pragmatics, where might you use that word, right? So um, I think it's really important to think of ourselves as teachers of language, because language and literacy are interdependent. So um, when we're teaching spelling, maybe it's we're teaching reading, but we're really teaching language, but that. it's benefiting yeah. <laughs> otherwise, right? Can I just say, I'm, I just listened to Emily Hanford's new Soul to Story yes. episode. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, and I just, she talked about that, like going overboard, right? We we found a problem with, we weren't teaching phonics and ph phon phonemic, phonemic awareness. awareness. And, mm -hmm. you know, now we're seeing some, some people, not everybody, but some people going overboard. And like you said, not talking about the meaning of those words. And so I'm really glad you brought that up of, you know, we have to find that bring it all together we, not we go do. overboard it's an integrated to the other language side. system we really do but again um teachers deserve the knowledge so that they can right um yeah. and then um just you know i shared instructional routines i think it's really important for teachers to have instructional routines that embed um clear concise language explicit um structures um, that embed that language and the kids get used to that routine, right? And so what we were doing with routines as teachers is we're setting them up for success when they're independent, right? We want them thinking, okay, I, I, I should say the word, I'll say the word so I can hear it. It's in my mouth, right? The font word now I have to think about the sounds. So um, I think instructional routines are critically important for teachers to um, marry the knowledge that they have. I always say the simple view of better outcomes for kids for me is, this is my simple view, is knowledge times practice. Because me having deep knowledge is critically important, but if I cannot translate that into practice, it doesn't matter for my students. So, um, and practice minus of knowledge, uh, as soon as those kids do something that um, you don't expect, you don't know what to do. So, mm -hmm. you cannot be diagnostic and prescriptive. So, we must have deep knowledge and align practices. Oh, I love that. We 
talk a lot about practice on our podcast. <laughs> Yay. I, I'm um, a little obsessed with practice too. <laughs> yeah. I have a quick question before we move on yep. about the simultaneous oral spelling routine. Mm -hmm. What happens with multisyllabic words? So I heard you talk about, you know, words and you're saying the sounds, but with multisyllabic words, do we say the syllables? Yes, yeah, so we would say the syllables and then we, it's like you're chunking it up, right? You're um, okay. breaking down a complex text. I think that, um, I'm not telling you anything you don't know or anyone else doesn't know. Multisyllabic words can really scare kids. <laughs> they yeah. see that big word and then they're like, oh my gosh, I can't do that. Um, but really we should be teaching um, multisyllabic words right from the beginning. If my students in kindergarten know um, CVC um, patterns for short vowels, that I, I'm doing napkin. Um, I'm building those words right from the beginning, um, but I'm teaching them how they can, okay, let's take the first syllable nap and then we're going to do the same thing. Say that. Say, I say it, you say it, let's tap out the sounds, you know, write the lines. So you're chunking it up until they start consolidating those patterns, right? Um, with enough, um, with enough practice with the words, um, they become as if by sight and with enough practice with reading words and spelling words, we start teaching ourselves, we start seeing patterns, and we no longer have to go um, to these, uh, just to the phoneme level, we start um, consolidating that when we get into Aries consolidated phase. Uh, but until we get there, um, we need to support that. But it's pretty much the same process, but your syllable, syllable, and then I would be blending. Nap, let's blend, what, what, um, what syllable, nap, Okay, and then we would do the kin, blend, napkin, word, napkin, right? So that um, I want them consolidating it and also hearing it in a fluent voice, right? Got and it. then in a sentence. So. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that quick little inter interlude <laughs> into multi-syllabic like, words. I was I like, almost grabbed the whiteboard here. <laughs> it was very hard not to. <laughs> I know. It is. Yes. Especially with multi-syllabic yes, words. <laughs> yes. Or, you know, there's also like the spot and dot routines um, that we often see both spot the vowels and do you understand what I'm saying? And also, of course, we need to be um, teach kids to be flexible um, with those vowels. Um, you know, that set for variability is really important. However, what I really want to point out about that is that for that, for you to engage in set for variability, you also have to have that word in your semantic lexicon. If you don't know um, that I should pronounce A-V-I-D, avid, instead of avid, when I flex it, um, I could say avid or avid, and you would say to the students, well, which one sounds? And they would, I don't know. So right. again, the importance of, um, you know, word recognition, language systems, and um, those upper ends of the rope always being integrated um, and how important in our own classrooms, um, our oral languages as a teacher, the way we are speaking, the way we expect our students to speak in, in complete sentences. We, we, can't, we can't forget about all of that while we're ensuring that they can, you know, map that code. For sure. Okay. So we know that like the way that we used to kind of do things wasn't as effective. And you did give us some really valuable instructional routines. Um, but one of the things that you did at the Plain Talk conference that I really do want to talk about is looking at spelling. So, it, you know, we're giving a spelling test. We've, we're doing these routines. We're giving a spelling test. It gave it valuable information. And I have to say, you really helped me like kind of rethink spelling tests. Um, so. <laughs> I was curious if you could share what can we learn from students' errors or miscues on, quote, a spelling test or just, you know, a writing sample where they're writing and then having miscues and errors. We can learn everything, actually, to be honest with you. I know that sounds a little bold, um, but uh, spelling and writing is language written down. Um, that's Louisa Motes, um, who's been studying spelling for decades now. You know, we have our um, spelling heroes like uh, Dr. Motes and Dr. Treeman and Dr. Carriker. Um, we've been fortunate to have um, researchers focus on spelling for many decades, but it really is language written down. Students are showing you what they know about our language in their spelling. And especially when, um, you know, what I shared at the um, Plain Talk, and what I've been trying to convince pretty much everyone I know uh, <laughs> as a teacher to do is to do a spelling inventory and to do those when you do your um, universal screeners like three times a year, you should also be doing a spelling inventory. 
um, because it follows a scope and sequence. Again, that systematic least complex to most complex, um, you know, short vowel patterns all the way up to um, derivational spellings and all that. Uh, depending on the grade level, of course. I mean, in kindergarten, I, I would start out with, can you, you know, I would say b spell b, right? <laughs> it's a building block. Um, but, you know, as they move up in the grades, the spelling inventory is a very critical tool to um, include in your assessment battery. The, the, uh, um, when you're, you know, conducting the spelling inventory in your classroom, it's, it's very simple. Um, you just have to make sure the kids aren't <laughs> looking, you know, little folders or something so they can't look on each other. And you, <laughs> I say the word, you say the word, I give it to them in a sentence, and then basically I just be quiet and have them spell it. You have to be careful when, uh, when we're pronouncing words that uh, just as there was schwa day on Sunday, uh, we don't overpronounce. So um, I would say bat. Uh, no, we don't want to do that. We want to be clear um, and accurate with how we're pronouncing the words. Um, but pretty much I say, you say, I tell it to you in a sentence, you spell it. It takes maybe 10 minutes to do. It's really a brief whole class assessment. That's the beauty of it. However, I will say that the analysis of it um, takes longer, but it really is time well spent. And especially if you're doing it at uh, grade level or with your um, peers, you start looking at patterns. And it's telling you, uh, the thing about a spelling inventory is it can tell you um, about your curriculum. If you start seeing, and in some schools this has actually happened that I've help support the analysis of that, you start seeing a pattern in every single classroom, every mm. single classroom where there's a hole where when you look at the um, phonics scope and sequence, this pattern has been taught, everyone's missing it, everyone, or many, many, many. So that's telling me maybe two things. Uh, the curriculum is um, not explicit enough. Um, the curriculum does not allow enough practice, or we didn't allow enough practice for this pattern. But it's it, there's a there's a hole here that has to be addressed, and that's so valuable. It's for me and analyzing um, a spelling inventory with teachers. It's really rich, robust professional learning. We are talking about patterns that we see. We're talking about um, phonology, orthography, morphology. Um, and one school that I work with, um, the kids were doing a great job. Now, this is second grade. Um, great job spelling phonetically. They um, represented all the speech sounds. They represented them in the correct sequence. But they were not orthographically correct in many cases for spelling patterns that they'd been taught. So that told me that maybe there was an overemphasis on phonology and not enough on the relationship. Now, we all know that phonemic awareness, absolutely essential, but a means to an end. We're doing this so that we can map those phonemes to graphemes because that's how they read and will spell. So when you see it in every classroom, so they had a phonics, phonics curriculum. So we're like, well, I don't think they're teaching it um, as robustly as they could, how can we support them, right? Because it's never the teacher's fault. It's oftentimes it's that as leaders in schools, we must be, if we, we have um, big changes and high, high accountability, we need high support. They are also reciprocal. Um, so we're looking at those through the lenses of phonology, orthography, and morphology, right? And uh, we're looking for error patterns. And we're looking for um, students with similar error patterns so that we can be efficient and effective with our time so that we can target small group instruction or whole group instruction when we see it happening uh, more than 60% across these spelling inventories is telling us that let's not waste our time on small group. Let's be efficient. And this is uh, something that has to be taught whole group and practice and then assess to see if it's been mastered, right? Because we all know we have Swiss cheese kids with these holes. And I'm telling you, they show up in spelling. They're smack dab in your face. Reading happens in the moment. You see reading behaviors, and they're elusive because they are done in the moment, and you have to be, as a teacher, kind of keeping track, right, of um, how they're reading, unless you're recording them, which is very helpful. But spelling is permanent. It's language written down. I can go back to it. I can look at a student's spelling in the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, the end of the year. Very powerful for a student to see, oh, I'm getting better. 
I can um, now um, spell this correctly and they feel proud of themselves and it's visually right there. So um, it's just a, such a, spelling inventories are a powerful instructional tool that I believe from all the work that I do in schools is underutilized and, and could greatly benefit. However, again, I do think that absence of um, knowledge, you need, um, you, need, you need the knowledge to know um, what you're looking at. And years ago, and I'll just speak for myself, I didn't, I didn't have that. Um, I feel very fortunate to have um, had the opportunity to learn what I have learned, but also feel like just like my Twitter handle, live to learn, uh, as teachers, you know, we're always learning for the rest of our lives, right? Pam, I'm wondering, do you ever look at the spelling for different stages? Like I'm thinking of like yes, Aries mm -hmm. stages or yeah, I think yep. Richard Gentry talked to us about yes, similar stages mm -hmm. he has in brain words. Do you look yep, for that yep. or do you just look for I those do, very yes. specific skills? I do that too. Yes. Oh. Yeah. So, um, yes, I, I'm aware of Gentry's uh, stages and Aries phases that kind of uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. stages phases and, phases. and stages. Um, so, um, yes, I definitely do that as well, because you would expect in the um, early grades, um, our kids would be semi phonetic initially. Right. They are um, aware of the speech sounds and they're represented with graphemes and maybe uh, just like what we were seeing in the second grade. You see, we would expect that they had moved towards a phonetic stage where they were representing all the sounds with graphemes that are orthographically correct. You know, ortho meaning straight and, you know, graphemes is spelling, like, you know, correct spelling. So, yes, definitely looking at them as well. And also, um, Ken Appel and Suzanne Carricker in that amazing uh, Bible, uh, you know, multi-sensory teaching our basic language skills. They also have um, ways that we can look at spelling um, because sometimes, um, at least the way when I was assessed of my spelling a long time ago, uh, was it was right or wrong. That's right. Um, and that doesn't give us a lot of information about teaching. I mean, because all this is really about informing our teaching, being formative to um, inform our teaching right now, right? Not moving on or, or finding ways to continue the sequence of learning, but um, having these differentiated groups that the, so the kids um, have these skills. So um, the um, characters is like a zero to a four, or zero you would think is very similar to um, a prefab in the stage, almost like a drawing of a word, um, and then moving towards um, maybe the external parts of the word. The, the same thing with Aries phases, right? And then the internal structure, but not the correct orthographic spelling, then the orthographic spelling, like the consolidated phase. So this is what I mean. So you and I, in just these few minutes, have talked about how we can look at them through phonology, orthography, morphology, lenses. We've talked about how we can look at them through um, stages and phases, gentry and airy. And we've talked about how we can look at them on a continuum of scoring um, from getting closer to the correct spelling for that word to inform our instruction. So I think that's four ways that a spelling inventory and 10 minutes of your instructional time can lead to some really rich, effective, targeted instruction. That's the important thing there too. Like we're, we're being really efficient with our instruction and because it's spelling, we can visibly see what we need to do next. Yeah. And just to kind of reiterate, Pam, the, the thing that's standing out to me is that if it's the majority of kids, go ahead and reteach it whole group. Yes. And then if it's not, and it's small sections of students, you know, grab them small group to reteach that very targeted skill. I love the idea of using the spelling test as a teaching tool. I don't think as a student I ever received that. I don't think as a teacher I ever did that um, with the primary grades at least. So I think that's so powerful to help the students see their errors instead of just see a test back and see like the, the red marks or whatever it might be. Like you're, you're teaching through error correction. And you're teaching them about language. Yeah. Wonderful. Their own language. How how exciting and powerful, right? Yeah. I have a quick question about the spelling inventories before uh -huh. we yep. wrap up. Just, yep. I'm wondering, is a spelling inventory something a teacher would create themselves, or are there spelling inventories out there that pe yes. that teachers can go to? Yes. Um. I um because I'm a. Ha I am and have been for many years a letters trainer, and thank you, Dr. Motes, um, Dr. Truman, and the others for all they taught us. I always use the letters spelling inventory. It, it is copyrighted, um, so um, there are others. The um, words their way spelling inventory does follow scope and sequence. I do um, recommend the spelling inventory, but not necessarily um, the vocabulary the program. 
Yeah, um, ex- oh, more explicit. Knit. So yeah. yes, um, selling inventory. Yes, I'll say okay. that. But um, so yes, there are some out there. And um, when you look at really good programs, um, they are embedding spelling as a mastery assessment, right? And why? There's a reason um, you fly uses uh, spelling for mastery. It's because it it demonstrated. The, the student's ability and you have it visibly right there um, when you're teaching spelling you are teaching reading or you're benefiting it so um, you know what happens often in a phonics lesson you know we, we have a, a review of what we've learned before we have a warm-up from phonological awareness we teach a new concept right um, um, and then we read it in connected text hopefully there's connection between what has been taught and then then we do the dictation and as teachers we run out of time often. And so what concerns me is oftentimes um, it's the practice of the skills that have been taught that we run out of time for. The, um, the reading of connected text with that pattern so we can consolidate that word in memory and orthographically map it or that pattern. And then with spelling, um, it does take time as it should. And kids are, you know, especially when they're younger, they have all those graphic motor things I'd consider too. But what I always say to teachers is you don't skip those parts don't skip the practice of that um, when they are um, reading connected text you're listening for accuracy and automaticity of the skill that's been taught and when you're encoding you are looking for you know the ability to represent that fully specified in print so um, I don't even know where but you know I don't know where that went but <laughs> there I am on my soapbox again what you decode you should encode what you encode you should be decoding you know read again they are reciprocal relationships but um you're going to get more bang for your buck i'm not saying skip the decoding but what i'm saying is please don't skip the encoding yeah that's very powerful all right pam what is one thing you'd love to leave our (laughs) listeners with in regards to teaching spelling um to borrow from um nike just do it (laughs) Um, do it um, do it directly do it systematically um, uh, do it formatively in terms of assessment use it to inform your instruction your intervention talk about the um, visible language that you see with your peers do it together you'll learn so much about language um, and how to um, target that instruction but it's really important to do it but to have those caveats of do it aligned with the research and the evidence for what's going to be most effective um, for your students because every teacher I know and you know that's what they want for their kids right yes absolutely yes (laughs) I know we've mentioned a lot of resources throughout this whole podcast but do you have any other suggestions for where people can learn more about spelling instruction um I have many (laughs) suggestions uh I have lots of give us your top few oh my god (laughs) Uh, top few. Um, speech to print, of course, um, without a doubt. Um, Louisa Motes, right? Yeah, Louisa Motes. Uh, Lynn Stone, Spelling for Life. Uh, okay. This is a, probably one, a newer one that maybe some folks aren't familiar with um, from uh, Sue Hegland, Beneath the Surface of Words. Oh, there you go. <laughs> That's a great too. one. Um, <laughs> I have a wakelet where I have like all kinds of spelling. You know, I'm a little crazy about that kind of stuff. But um, um, how spelling supports reading is something Louisa Motes wrote many years ago. There's another one, How Spelling Casts a Spell by Joshi Treeman, Motes and Character. Um, you know, the, um, the multisensory basic skills, an excellent chapter in there from Character. The Louise Spear Swirling book recently that came out that had um, about structured literacy and spelling. Louisa did that chapter on spelling. So, there's a lot out there, honestly, that's really good for spelling. And those are just some that come off the top of my head. And I have lots of other ones over here. The other thing I want to say is for anyone who has a knowledge around um, the phonemes of our language, I ne- uh, back to my Taylor Swift song, I never, ever, ever look at spelling without a, <laughs> without a, um, a consonant and vowel chart right next to me. I never, ever ever do that. And when I'm thinking about orthography, I always have the phonic scope and sequence uh, for what has been taught because I don't expect them to spell a pattern that has not yet been taught, right? And hopefully we are teaching morphology. And so I'm looking at the morphemes that have been taught. And so therefore I'm expecting, so I'm never expecting um, students to spell what has not been taught, which, which means we need to be, we actually need to be teaching it directly and explicitly. So there yeah. you go. 
books. <laughs> Pam, I'm hopeful that maybe you could uh, take a picture of your book stack for us and send it to oh, us yeah, one day. I like will. some at some point in the yeah, future, we'll we'll blast it on social because okay. I think everyone would be interested. Like Pam Kastner spelling resources <laughs> recommendations. Uh, yeah. A little obsessed there. Sorry. No, it's so great. I just, I was writing it down and I think I lost track at some point, but I'll listen again. So okay. we have the Padlet to link, Lori, right? Is that, are we allowed to link that, Pam? From oh, Plank yeah. Talk? You can link the Padlet and um, yeah. I have a Wakelet too. Yeah. yeah. We'll make it hot. I mean, your episode's going to come out right as it gets hot in uh, the United States. So here we go. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. This was such a joy and keep on spelling. Yeah.